you know, many times uh, I, I've told people I could stop the, the flooding in the Mississippi. All you have to do is give me the three states of Illinois, Iowa, and Indiana. Just give them to me. We'll put them back in perennial grass. We'll put cattle back on that land. And those floods will stop. And it will actually change the weather. Good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are. Welcome to this um, this incredible event that's coming up in the Life Saves the Planet series. We are um, honored and very happy to be presenting Rid Shin and Lynn Pledger, who have just published a book called Grass-Fed Beef for a Post-Pandemic World. And, um, and I think we have a very rich, a very rich program ahead of us. Let me let me start by saying that um, we've known we being Bio for Climate has known Ridge since 2014 when we put on our first conference at Tufts University, restoring ecosystems to reverse global warming, and Ridge was very it was a seminal conference. And Ridge was one of the truly seminal speakers and laid a groundwork for understanding the importance of regenerative grazing um, for not only to produce nutrient-dense food, but for human health, for animal health, soil health, human health. Um, I still remember some really critical health-related things that I first learned from Ridge's first talk. So. Ridge has since then spoken at at, uh, at least one other conference. He also spoke earlier in this Life Saves the Planet series. And his presentation this evening with Lynn adds a, a new dimension to that earlier work. So let me say a little bit about them. Ridge is the founding CEO of Grazier LLC, which is also known as Big Picture Beef. Big Picture Beef was a title that Lynn came up with. She can explain what it means later <laughs> if she wants. It's a 100% grass-fed beef company that partners with farmers throughout the Northeast United States. Early in Ridge's career, he became interested in heritage breeds of livestock and co-founded the group now known as the Livestock Conservancy. Another break from Ridge's thing, but Ridge and Lynn met at Old Sturbridge Village in Sturbridge, Massachusetts, which is a farm that replicated the agricultural techniques of the 19th century. They were both interested in those agricultural practices and, um, and formed a, a working and more than that partnership for, for the last 50 years. So, um, Returning to Ridge's bio a bit, he was the founding director of the New England Livestock Alliance, which helped farmers find markets for their meat. And he also, um, he co-founded a group now known as the Livestock Conservancy. He has, he has basically educated the Northeast, which would be New England, New York, and probably Pennsylvania and New Jersey on the benefits of grazing regeneratively. And he has, in addition, consulted in New Zealand, England, Uruguay, Argentina, and for the Lakota of the Cheyenne River Reservation. His work has been recognized in the Smithsonian, the Atlantic, the New York Times, and Time Magazine which dubbed him a carbon cowboy. Lynn, Lynn Pledger is a writer, environmental advocate, and co-author of this book. For decades, she has worked with Ridge to preserve heritage livestock breeds and increase regenerative grazing in the Northeastern United States. She's also worked on public policy issues such as waste reduction, climate change, and energy in affiliation with organizations such as Clean Water Action, Sierra Club, and Upstream. 
She's been a guest lecturer on sustainability topics at UMass Amherst, Smith College, Lesley University, and the Harvard School of Public Health. In addition, she's preschooled two children and one grandchild and is now living in Western Mass, writing fiction and poetry. I guess I want to just add that when they were when they were at the farm in Sturbridge, they were basically learning that family farm practices in the 1800s and right up to World War II, those practices managed cattle in ways that worked with nature rather than against it. Working with nature is increasingly recognized as absolutely essential to addressing climate change and global warming. I think you'll find their talk very informative and very timely. So let me turn the talk over to Ridge and Lynn, who are going to be presenting some slides kind of alternately back and forth. Our new book about regenerative grazing proposes that grass-fed beef can be raised in every region of the United States. Uh, this kind of a decentralized system for producing beef would make our country more resilient in terms of crisis. Next slide. In recent years, our food system has been challenged by a number of shocks. The pandemic, fires, ransomware attacks, extreme weather, all of which cause temporary food shortages. And of course, these events are predicted to become more frequent, particularly as climate change becomes more severe. So our communities need reliable sources of nutrient dense food and uh, children and poor communities are especially vulnerable to meat shortages. Next slide, please. For decades, we've been told that red meat and dairy products are bad for health. Um, one problem uh, with those findings has been that red meat has been conflated with processed meat. Uh, also, grass-fed beef has uh, not been distinguished in these reports from corn-fed feedlot beef. Uh, but in fact, uh, meat, whether it's uh, feedlot beef or, or grass-fed, is highly digestible protein and also provides important nutrients, such as iron, zinc, and um, certain vitamins. Uh, but as we will note in this presentation, grass-fed beef is especially nutritious and, and we'll explain that. Next slide, please. So this just um, to set the stage is about four multinational corporations to control about 85% of the beef supply. The beef are raised on these feedlots, which you're all familiar with the term CAFO, confined animal feeding operation. These are huge uh, entities with up to 10,000 animals. And about 97% of all the beef in the country are raised on these uh, feedlots and harvested by these four processors. So they control the supply, they control the price. And when we have shortages in the grocery store, they seem to somehow figure out how to make money in spite of all of those things. Next slide, please. This slide gives you just a quick, just the just a position of the feedlot and regenerative grazing. On the left, the picture you're looking at is actually a feedlot from a Google picture. And all those rectangles are actually uh, lots of cattle, 100, 100 cattle or so in a pen. So those are all pens of cattle. And what you see to the right of the picture are all the nutrients or manure and urine that come from those cattle. You don't need to know much about this to look at that lagoon of um, manure and say, oh my God. And of course those lagoons break and eventually these nutrients go down to Mississippi and kill the Gulf of uh, Mexico. On the right, of course, is what we advocate, which is regenerative grazing, where the cattle are raised on grass outside for their whole lives and not cramped in a pen and stayed, you know, for 120 days in one place. Next slide. This is just a picture. Uh, it's a map of the U.S. The colors indicate uh, where crops are grown for livestock and where crops are grown for people. 
So you can see the old prairie, the heartland, is predominantly planted to corn and soy for animal feed. States like Iowa, 100% corn and soy. So these states are <clears throat> completely dedicated to feeding the feedlots and the animals rather than feeding humans. So it's, a, it's an upside down situation. Um, and um, we, we feel that it could be replaced, of course, with regenerative grazing. Um, next slide. Uh, so uh, we just uh, want to add there that, um, especially now with hunger rising globally, in part due to grain shortages, grain should not be fed to cattle, especially since cattle are healthier feeding themselves in a pasture. So, but now we are, that's what's happening uh, is that uh, cattle are fed uh, corn and the corn has to be grows, grown with a lot of uh, uh, practices that are very detrimental to the environment. Uh, and then trucks have to carry the corn, the cattle, uh, two feedlots. And uh, some of them are, you know, lo long distances away, hundreds of miles away. So a lot of trucks involved in that. Um, and um, for example, here in the Northeast, oh, let's see, 433,000 beef cattle a year born here. And every year they are trucked west to be fattened on feedlots when they could be fattened in pastures right here in the Northeast. And then once the cattle have been slaughtered and processed and the meat packaged, it's trucked all over the country, right? Um, so uh, these are very long supply chains. Uh, so because as, as Ridge said, the, the, these four big corporations have giant facilities and when these closed down as they did um, in um, 2020 with the COVID-19 pandemic, um, the effect is felt all over the country. There's no way if, you know, if, if a facility is, is killing, you know, thousands of animals a day that they can uh, deal with, with a shock like that to the system. They're efficient, but they can't deal with shocks. And, um, uh, these shocks that we've mentioned, the uh, pandemics and ransomware attacks and so forth, um, it's no longer hypothetical. We have to figure this out. And um, what we've figured out is that we need shorter supply chains. Next slide, slide please. So the fact is uh, grass-fed beef can be fattened on, on pasture in every region of the United States. If we transitioned from corn-fed beef to 100% grass-fed beef, we could then have much shorter supply chains. And every region of the country could be supplying a healthy meat to their own population. So meat could be local, at least local to the region. And the reason this is possible is because the regenerative practices that we'll get into later are adaptable to various climates and soils. Um, so it, it truly is possible uh, already, it's happening that uh, there are grass-fed beef producers all over the country um, from, from deserts to snowy climes. And it, it works out because the, the practices are uh, adapted. In other words, if you're in a dry area, you're only going to graze a, a particular paddock once during the season. Uh, uh, and then you won't be grazing that particular piece till next year. But here in the Northeast, where we've got a lot of rain, you can go back two or three times to a paddock and graze it again. So there are adapt adaptations uh, can and are made for, for the climate, but it's still uh, the basic regenerative practices that we'll go over um, um, can be done and the, uh, all the benefits to the environment, to, to climate, to cattle health and human health can be realized. So we're gonna talk more about that um, why the regenerative approach is so much better than the feedlot model. Um, the reasons for transitioning away from the feedlot production to regenerative is about more than saving food miles. It's also about the environment and particularly about combating climate change. Next slide, please. So back for a minute, to, I've just mentioned climate change. So back to the corn, a corn uh, based model now. Uh, one problem with it that comes as a surprise to many people is that 
um, the plowing itself to, uh, uh, and the cultivation of corn uh, releases carbon dioxide to the uh, to the atmosphere. When ground is bare, soil carbon oxidizes. It's a process akin to rusting. Uh, and I want to add that this also occurs in vegetable production for meatless burgers. Um, those meatless burgers are uh, have a vegetable components, and those are industrially produced vegetables. It involves all the um, destructive practices that we're going to talk about in terms of growing uh, corn for cattle. So when when you um, when you see a plowed field, what you don't see is that carbon dioxide that's rising from the bare ground, which we try to indicate there with those uh, little arrows. Next slide, please. Could I could I ask um, a question? It's kind of come up about the previous slide. Sure. That one, yes. About which, what, which one? The map? The map. Okay. And what, and what those stars represent. Oh, these are these are just the USDA regions of the country. So the star is where the 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 regional offices are. That's all. Okay, is that separate from the NRCS offices? Uh, I don't know how they relate. Uh, yeah, they're probably all together. I don't. Know. I I, I okay. rather doubt it because the well the USDA has has designated these areas, and then uh, uh, the the uh, NRCS. Um, you know, yeah, it, 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 it is under the USDA, but uh, mm -hmm. I, I, the reason I chose this slide is it just shows all the different regions that I wanted, wanted to point out in contrast to that slide where all the red and pink states or states growing animal feed um, that, that all over the country, you, we can grow um, right. not, not grains, but grass and pasture forage. Uh, the NRCS has offices in every state. So uh, I should I probably should not have brought up the NRCS <laughs> because our audience doesn't know what that is. And I right, should right. not. So keep going. That, that, <laughs> Natural Resources Conservation Services. Yeah. And, yeah. and they've done they've done a lot of good work. And then we actually will we'll probably refer to their work at some point here. So where were we uh, back to? Um, yeah, uh, cool. OK, we have enough land for grazing without cutting forests. I, I think this is important because uh, um, we um, we often hear people concerned about, do we have enough land? And uh, we do. We, we could. In fact, this photo says a lot about <laughs> what's what's wrong with U.S. agriculture. Uh, subsidies, that is our tax dollars, have encouraged plowing of grasslands to grow more cattle corn, even though corn production is destructive for the environment and particularly bad for the climate. So this land where cattle feed is now grown could be used for regenerative grazing. And uh, uh, and in fact, um, it, it can also, it can be used in conjunction with, with cropping. Uh, a, a number of farmers are doing this now and, and uh, you know, crop farmers are, are beginning to integrate livestock in their cropping systems. And it, the results have been so spectacular in terms of increased production and being able to cut back on fertilizers and other off-farm inputs that um, it, the livestock have been called, the grazing has been called the multiplier effect. So um, we another, another source of land for grazing would be um, there's a government program that pays farmers to keep some land out that's co uh, covered with ground cover to prevent erosion. And so that would be a, a land that would be available too, because of course that's what pasture is. It's a, it's a year round ground cover. Next slide. So that's a good segue to this slide that pasture is a period of corn for a number of reasons. One thing, nutritionally, they're a lot better for cattle than a monoculture, monocrop. Um, the, the cattle's rumen likes a mix of things rather than one, uh, one feed. Actually, the corn makes uh, cattle <clears throat> sick on the feedlot. It creates acidosis uh, because of the, it's uh, mostly corn in the diet. And actually, one of the big inputs on the feedlot is baking soda that comes in in tractor trailers in an attempt to buffer the rumen of the, uh, of the bovine. Um, so um, the, the 
um, pasture is the diversity, the poly, you know, different plants in the pasture is great for the cattle. And it also serves as an environment for the microbes and other wildlife, butterflies, birds, et cetera, et cetera. And it prevents um, erosion, but it also is um, important piece of the pasture looking like this is that it's a solar collector. So it is what is doing the photosynthesis, taking the carbon dioxide out of the air, taking it into the plant, changing it, and then putting it down into the soil. So the, the, um, the perennial pasture is so much better for the land than the monocultures that we grow with poisons, biocides, and all those other things. Um, next slide. <laughs> So this is uh, just a slide showing uh, some grass-fed beef being managed. Um, <clears throat> as Lynn pointed out, this is being done all over the country. There's many, many early adopters. I've kind of been in the practice for about 20 years, but there's lots and lots of people that are doing it. There's a whole lot to it. You have to have the right kind of cattle. Um, you have to know what you're doing. And a big, big piece of the puzzle is that the cattle uh, do not want to be parked in one place. They want to move and part of the moving is so that they have uh, better feed to eat and then the plants have a chance to regenerate once they are moved on. Um, but there's a whole, we're not going to spend this talk talking about how to do it because there's a lot of people doing it. There's a lot of, read the book, there's a lot of things in the book to tell you about it. Um, no, next slide. Okay, um, the, the, uh, some of the principles uh, of uh, regenerative grazing are, will be familiar to, to many of you because uh, the, the movement is, is just building on principles of, of other soil focused movements that, uh, that you're well aware of. One being organic, of course. Uh, uh, best practices for regenerative grazing means no chemical fertilizers or biocides. Uh, I, I think it's important to say here that that farmers and ranchers um, don't typically uh, jump in and eliminate uh, uh, fertilizers, for example, the first year. Uh, it, there's a transition typically, and that's uh, recommended that they cut down on their um, on their off farm inputs. But within a few years, um, many uh, are able to eliminate the cost of those things. And in fact, their operations become uh, 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 net profitable because uh, that they're, they, they're, the ground is more productive and they don't have the expense. And the reason why you know the, the organic approach is important here is because um, you need to eliminate chemicals that are that harm soil microbes, uh, and we'll get into that in a minute. Why these uh, soil microbes, the fungi and the bacteria, and and so forth, are are allies. Uh, so, so the whole idea, the the most important idea for regenerative grazing, uh, is fostering robust populations of soil microorganisms. Uh, so as, as in permaculture practices, um, and, and many people are familiar with permaculture now, uh, as Riz, Riz just explained, the regenerative principles call for the ground to be covered by growing plants that conduct photosynthesis and are pumping carbon into the soil. Um, and the third thing I mentioned here is the, um, the holistic plant grazing, or some people call it adaptive multi-paddock grazing. There's quite a few names for it. We tend to call it regenerative grazing. It, 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 they all mean the same thing, which is essentially the, the grazier or whoever is moving the cattle is moving them in a rotation of paddocks um, uh, with long recovery periods for each grazed paddock before it's grazed again. So this is really important. Um, it's not, if you don't, if you don't uh, follow this, uh, this pattern of a rotation where you allow for long recovery periods, then it's not really regenerative and it's not going to, you're not going to get the environmental impact that we're looking for. 
Uh, when I say each paddock has to thoroughly recover or, or regenerate before being grazed again, this isn't exactly rest for the land because what's happening, uh, you can't see it because it's underground, but the soil microorganisms are very busy when the cattle have gone, they're not, they're grazing somewhere else. Meanwhile, the soil microbes are working hard. They are supplying the plants, those graze plants with the nutrients they need to regrow. Uh, and, and they're also busy sequestering carbon in the soil, uh, which we will describe in a few minutes, but that's, that's very key. Um, we've been talking so far mostly about the fact that we could have much shorter supply chains uh, and become more food resilient with this method, but a lot of people are, are most excited about it because uh, so much uh, carbon can be sequestered in this natural way uh, that provides so many multiple benefits. And as we said before, these principles can be adapted to a wide range of climates and soil types. Next slide, please. Yeah, so carrying on from what Lynn was saying, these uh, grazing principles work in many different areas of the country. So the picture on the left is in the Chihuahuan Desert. It was a desert, but the uh, some of the ranchers in that desert started using these principles and um, the uh, this is the result. You know, grass has come in. It looks different than our grass here in the Northeast, but it's grass and the birds come back in. And actually what they've found is they can take this desert land, create grass and, and graze many more cattle than um, they could before. And, um, you know, the whole ecosystem is healthier with, with birds and insects and everything returning. In, uh, you know, other areas of the country have different challenges. So, you know, here in the Northeast, we have winter, but um, we also uh, know that cattle can be raised here on grass entirely. And one of the things, as Lynn said, that's important is that the cattle are moved and they're not parked in one place. A lot of times you see cattle and you see the grass is only like, an looks like a golf course. And there's really nothing for the cattle to eat when the grass is like a golf course. Next picture, please. This is a picture of um, a, a project I did here in central Massachusetts, actually in the East Coahuila Land Trust, where we, what we did is we saved 20 acres of grass in the summertime. We did not graze it after July. And we tested the grass. We sent the test to Dairy One, a, a lab out at Cornell University. And then we <clears throat> kept the cattle off that grass until um, December. We brought the cattle back in December January and February. And we grazed in those months. And each month we took a sample of the grass and sent it to the laboratory. So we developed the grass of the nutritional quality of the grass. But we also, by looking at the animals, and that you can see in the right-hand picture, this is what they were eating. It looks like dried hay, right? But it was in the field. And we didn't have any expense of cutting the hay, putting it in a barn, bringing it out with a tractor. And actually the, ha the cattle, when we checked them with the vet in the spring, he remarked on how healthy they were. So this is a, a, um, you know, a technique that can be done as a management technique. And it can be done all over the country, stockpiling grass and then letting the cattle eat it rather than using machines to make hay, put it in the barn and bring it back to the cattle. It's really uh, uh, an interesting thing. It's a hard sell to most farmers that... Uh, uh, just automatically make hay. Um, <clears throat> next slide. <clears throat> Another technique that we've used, and this is a technique that's used uh, when you're converting land from um, a crop like corn or soy back into a perennial, or in this case of this picture, this is a farm I worked with in North Carolina. They were, we had um, burnt out tobacco land. But what we did is planted what's called a cover crop and we call it a cocktail cover crop because we, we try to get at least eight species of plants into the mix. And uh, so the cover crop grows up on this land that is, you know, kind of been uh, abused. The cover crop still grows. And then we graze the cattle and we graze them real tight. You can see this, they, these cattle are close together, shoulder to shoulder. And then when they're through eating this paddock, we move them to the next. And what we find is this stimulates both the cattle, we get incredible daily rates of gain from the cattle, 
but we also get incredible stimulation of the subsoil microbes and uh, all the flora and fauna that are below the soil when you grow this cover crop. You have a diverse um, cover crop. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> Okay, um, this, this, what I'm about to explain is something very, very exciting to me and it was new, new to me not too many years ago and, um, and perhaps it will be new to some of you, but it's, it's really a remarkable uh, thing that um, what, when a cow takes a bite of grass, and that grass is then partially defoliated and will need nutrients to grow. There is a feedback mechanism that kicks in. And in, so in response to being defoliated, the plant sends a chemical signal to its roots to exude some of the carbon that it has stored there. We all remember from school days, right? We've all learned what photosynthesis was, what happens. And we, we learned that the plant takes the carbon out of the air and it uses some of it to grow and it stores some in its roots. So it's got a lot of carbon down there. And so you may be wondering why if the plant is defoliated, it would it would send a signal to the roots to, to uh, kind of leak some of that carbon into the soil. So you wonder how will that help with nutrition? Well, with plant nutrition, well, uh, um, this is what I'm getting to those uh, Carbon compounds, which you can think of as sugary little bits into the soil, attract microbes. And then a burst of microbial activity begins, as we'll see in the next two slides. Next slide, please. Um, and I, I'll say right off that uh, the, the lead, the lead uh, microbe is the mycorrhizal fungi. And, the mycorrhizal just means that these, these um, fungi are in, on, and around the roots of the plants. And in this uh, slide, you'll see to the left is a diagram um, that I, I have just to sh show you diagrammatically. There's the root. You can see all the little cells uh, um, uh, represented there. And um, the, the fungi are there. And what they do is they create, the fungi make these long filaments that um, extend out you know, beyond the root and extend way into the soil, far beyond the reach of the roots themselves. And um, these are carbon coated filaments, they're called hi-fi, and they do a couple really important things. One, they bind the elements of the soil together, uh, you know, uh, sand, minerals, everything it, it is, is, is kind of wrapped up in this sticky uh, hi-fi and they bind it together so that, uh, and it, in the diagram, it, I just show two ag aggregate soil aggregates, but in fact, the soil becomes um, well aggregated so that it looks like chocolate cake. Uh, ideally, if it's healthy, that's what it looks like. It's got this kind of airy structure. And the great thing about that airy structure, there's little, uh, think of it as a sponge. Um, there's openings, holes, if you will, that allow the soil to take in water and retain it. And um, that's really key because uh, uh, in, well, let's go, the next slide will help uh, with this next slide, please. So um, you see on on the left, I'm showing these two extremes. So the but they're two sides of the same coin. Uh, it, if the soil can't take in water, if it doesn't have this healthy aggregated structure, uh, rainwater is going to run off. You're going to have flooding because the soil can't accept the water. Uh, on the other hand, um, if the soil can't accept the water, it's dry. It can't retain the water that it, if it never accepted it. So um, soil that has good structure has that the spaces between the aggregates that have been made by the by the uh, the fungi uh, where water can be stored. And um, so this in this way, this structure pr provides protection against both floods and, and droughts. And um, I, I said we might mention the NRCS, uh, and now is a good time because it's a wonderful uh, uh, 
little YouTube that you can see online. And what it shows is that NRCS does a, a demonstration in three, a, three fields that come together. They're contiguous so that, that you know, they had the same climate and the uh, uh, rig, uh, originally the same kind of soils, but they've been managed a different way. One has been managed by planting corn, the other by conventional grazing, and the third by this regenerative grazing that we have described. So in this test to see how long it would take to, um, in, to take in a given amount of water, um, the cornland took 31 minutes, half an hour to soak in this water. The conventionally grazed land uh, infiltrated the water much, much sooner, seven minutes. Great, right? But the regeneratively grazed land took the water in in 10 seconds. And in this wonderful YouTube, you, you can see this happening. Uh, it's remarkable. So uh, half an hour or 10 seconds. And that's what regenerative grazing can do. It can create this healthy, uh, well-structured soil. So just think, you know, uh, you, we've all remember the horrible um, pictures of the flooding along the, in the Mississippi watershed. A lot of that is because that soil has no carbon sponge. That's corn land. That's land that where the carbon is gone up into the atmosphere. So think what it could mean to our farms and ranches um, if, if just by different soil management. Next slide, please. This photo shows a tiny portion of the microbial network that exists around roots when the soil is healthy. I just wanted to show you in the diagram, I'd showed one or two of these filaments, but as you can see, it's, it's just a, a mass of them. And uh, many people are, have become aware of the microbial networks beneath the forest floor. There's been a lot in the media about that, about how there's all this communication uh, uh, between microbes and, and trees and between uh, one tree to another and so forth. Well, the same kind of network exists uh, under grassland, but the grassland hasn't gotten the, the press. We don't have the Save the Grasslands movement, although Ridge and I are, are doing our best to start one. Actually, I shouldn't say just Ridge and I, people, uh, you know, we're, we're, we've been working for years with people all over the country have mentored us to understand how this works. Um, so, um, so this is one of the important functions um, that, that I want to be clear that, that happens here. I've mentioned the, aggregate, the aggregating that happens with these filaments, but maybe even more important is the trans transporting of soil nutrients and water to the plant roots. That's why you get this tremendous uh, boost in productivity uh, if you have the regenerative grazing um, if, if you have a, um, a healthy, uh, robust population of microbes, because they're doing this critically important work, they are reaching soil nutrients and water to the plant roots that the plant roots couldn't reach, uh, you know, without them. But the other thing they're doing, and this should be uh, uh, interesting and and important to everyone who's concerned about climate change is that these same uh, filaments are transporting carbon from the roots into the soil. They themselves are coated with carbon um, and uh, that would prevents them from leaking. That's how they can transport the water without leaking because they have this sticky carbon coating. So it's a two way exchange. Uh, I mean, you can think of it that way as a, uh, you know why? Why would the why would the microbes be doing this? Well, uh, you know, transporting the water and the um, soil nutrients. Well, what they're getting in exchange is carbon, and of course they're eating some of it, but they're storing the rest in the soil, and that's how they sequester so much carbon. And that's why in the regeneratively grazed areas, the carbon, as long as the livestock are on the ground. Uh, Richard Teague, uh, a research ecologist, uh, of um, who's done wonderful work on this says, you know, he's been documenting this on land for where they've been grazing regeneratively for 15 years as, an, as long as the livestock are on the land, the carbon is increasing every year. So uh, uh, next slide, please. And we'll look at how regenerative farmers and ranchers achieve 
healthy soil, yes. healthy pasture. I'm, healthy yeah, animals. I'm gonna I'm gonna jump in on this one, and uh, and we're getting a message from the people running the webinar. We got to speed it up. But okay. I'm gonna linger on this picture because this is the crux. The uh, um, <clears throat> we all have heard of the buffalo. And in reality, the system that we've adopted is a biomimicry of the buffalo. So everybody knows about the buffalo. There were deep, deep soils, you know, eight foot deep, tall, tall grass. And you can see these buffalo, they're all grouped together and they're walking through. Imagine the urine and the manure and the grass is trampled. There's nothing to eat. So they move. And as they move, then they give that grass that time to regrow, regenerate. This was just a natural system. And, you know, the, the symbiosis of the large herbivore, the photosynthesis, the plant and the soil and the soil microbes is what built those deep soils. So we, you know, this system works. It works historically. And what we are trying to do is mimic that um, natural system with cattle. And we do it by using electric fence. You can see in the picture on the right, cattle love to be together. Uh, they love to be in a herd. If one of them gets separated, they want to get back in the group. And um, so we just manage them with a wire, one electric wire. We move it and they they move and they have a new uh, area to eat. And uh, <clears throat> so it's a system. It's not a no brainer. You, you do have to apply management. And that's why the term adaptive multi paddock grazing or regenerative grazing implies someone who knows how to do this uh, managing the cattle um, to, to make sure they have plenty to eat every day and then to make sure the grass has time to regenerate before it gets raised again. Next slide. <clears throat> this is just kind of dealing with the, everybody says cattle, methane, you know, that's the big problem. What, um, <clears throat> If you take a cow and put it in a university on a concrete pad with a plastic tent around it and you measure, you will get a lot of methane. If you put cow on a feedlot where there's no uh, biological activity, you'll get a lot of methane. If you put the cattle in the field where there are methanotropic bacteria in the soil, which feed on methane as their food stuff, then a lot of the methane gets um, eaten by these bacteria. And we also have learned, the sciences are learning that there is uh, bacteria, um, hydroxyl molecules in the zone just above the soil that also uses methane. So the methane is, uh, there still is some methane produced, no doubt about it, but the difference in a natural system is uh, dramatically different than the methane produced by the cattle in the feedlot and um, the, uh, <clears throat> you know, where, where the cattle are stationary all the time and the manure accumulates until it runs downstream to the lagoon. Rich, before we, you, we leave that slide, I just want to uh, clarify that the bacteria are not acting, technically they're not eating the methane, they're oxidizing the methane, they're neutralizing it uh, by taking an electron. So just we don't want to go into the weeds, but we, we also don't want to say anything that's not quite quite accurate. So sorry about that little interjection. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> this is one of the fascinating things, and we've found this both in the farm here in Hardwick, and it's been proven in this uh, <clears throat> peer-reviewed research that when you take a piece of land, say out of corn land, this land that you're looking at is a picture of the uh, Mandale Hill in Hardwick, Massachusetts. And it was a corn field before we started grazing. And if you look at this grass, that grass is four feet tall, so thick you can hardly walk through it. And what the research shows is that you increase the biomass per acre threefold, 300%. And Richard Teague anecdotally is finding in research that hasn't been peer reviewed and published yet that it's as much as sixfold. So you can imagine the boon to a producer to have three to six times the amount of biomass generated off the same piece of land. And this is done simply by managing the cattle. And you're also managing the microbes in the soil 
and the photosynthesis and all those things. You know, you have to maintain a solar collector. You have to um, <clears throat> move the cattle, let the grass rest for it, for this to happen. But it but it happens. It happens. All, um, you know, it's particularly advantageous here in the northeast where we have rain. We have a huge advantage in that we have rain, which makes this happen faster, much faster than it does on the Chihuahuan Desert. Next slide. Okay. Um, you know, I have here listed some pretty well-known benefits of, of grass-fed beef, and I'm not going to go through them because we're getting short on time here. And it's pretty easy to find these because it's been now, I think, decades that this has been known. This is not uh, in dispute um, that grass-fed beef has these benefits. But I want to go right to the next slide um, because um, this this is a, a new finding, and, and this is really quite uh, interesting that found recently that the, the nutrients from the plants or phytonutrients are actually concentrated in the, in the meat of grass-fed cattle, um, meat and milk as well. Uh, um, it's, it's not, you know, any more protein, but it's, uh, vitamins and trace minerals, for example, twice as much riboflavin than grain in grain fed. Uh, threefold as much as I mean as grain fed. So this is new information now. And it's it's important because grass fed beef can offer nutrients from pasture plants that humans can't eat because our bodies can't digest the cellulose. But if the regenerative grazing becomes widespread throughout the US um, and um, th this, this healthy beef would be produced close to home, close to everybody's home. Next slide, please. So I just want to add here that um, it, it's really, it's not surprising this, what, what I've just said about the benefits because there's maybe 200,000 wild plant species, but only a few hundred of these have been domesticated um, and are uh, you know, eaten as vegetables uh, by, by humans. And only a dozen of these species out of 200,000 are um, account for 80% of the crops that are grown uh, for human consumption. So, um, so the cattle really can, we, through, through eating ruminants, we can access nutrients that would, we'd be hard pressed to get at in any other way. And next slide, please. <clears throat> Yeah, so, so this is kind of in conclusion, you know, how does it all work? And what we found is that the markets are the key to uh, pulling on the rope to get this product into the markets. Today, about 97% of the beef is, is grown on a feedlot and fed corn. Only three, maybe we're pushing 4% now is done in this regenerative way. And, and it needs the embrace of the consumer to pull it into the marketplace. And, and uh, what's necessary for the consumer, well, both for the vendor, the grocery store, or the, or the institution, the university, or whoever's buying this product, it needs to be consistent quality. So that requires a lot of decisions about the right kind of cattle, the right kind of management. And we feel this, the big, big piece is aggregation of the animals uh, to get the volumes, to provide uh, the volume. Next slide, please. This is a, a diagram kind of of our uh, idea. So there is in the cattle industry, there's a bifurcation of the industry and in that there's all these cow-calf farms around the country. The national average is 30 or 40 head on the cow-calf farm. And almost all of these calves are collected or aggregated by the cattle dealers and eventually end up out on the feedlot. As Lynn said earlier, for over 400,000 in the Northeast go west of the feedlot. There's a few people that market directly, but it's a very small number in the big picture. But our idea is that the cow-calf farm, uh, the cows have a very different nutritional need, the cows and calves, from the finishing cattle, the cattle that are gonna get fat. And <clears throat> the way we have been doing it is we have some finishing farms, forage finishing farms, so we have one farm, for instance, in Vermont, that's 1,800 acres of contiguous grass. Uh, one summer, they had 650 head on that one farm. And they're able to move those whole herds like the buffalo and able to then 
make the cattle fat fairly efficiently in a big herd. So we feel like we should just keep the bifurcation industry. You have the stock on the cow-calf farm. It gets aggregated to a finishing farm rather than a feedlot. And then from the finishing farm, it goes to process. And that's kind of the concept that we think is the future. And it allows us to develop enough volume to, uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, to get some, some efficiencies of the, of the volume. Next slide. Okay, well, um, I think we've, uh, I hope we've made the point that the concept of regenerative grazing is uh, been developed and proven. Um, the land is available. Uh, consumers want this project product. And uh, if, if you want the product, we urge you to go to your grocers and say, why don't you carry 100% grass fed beef? Um, and of course, the methodology is at hand. Next slide. So I just want to say, uh, Ridge and I want to uh, ensure you that we have a lot more to say about this. And we said it in our book, Grass Fed Beef for Post-Pandemic World. So we hope you'll take a look and, and learn more details. And so thank you very much for your attention. And I think we may have some questions. Can I get one last word? When, when oh, absolutely, to... Ridgeway. <laughs> when you go but to but your Ridge, grocery... Just go let, me tell the, let me tell the audience before you do that, that we have an additional 10 minutes. So we'll be able to do audience questions just so that people don't disappear thinking that we're going to end at six o'clock, uh, seven okay. o'clock. Okay, my, my quick comment is the green would lend that you should go into your grocery store pound on the counter and say you want 100% grass fed beef, but you also should say you want it regeneratively grazed and you want it from the local region. Because most of the grass fed beef in the marketplace, 80% is from Australia or Uruguay or someplace like that. And you can actually bring a container load of beef to the Port of Boston, you can grind it up in Massachusetts, and you can actually put a label on the package that says product of USA. So it's a real deception for the consumer, and you as a consumer need to sort that out. But it's important to ask for local and... Uh, <clears throat> Great, now we're ready for questions. Okay, so... I have some questions, but I think I'd like to honor the audience questions first that have come in. Mm -hmm. And uh, the first one was, you know, what what actually happens that causes CO2 to be released by bare ground? Ridge, you, you touched on that a bit, but I think that... Well, and Lynn touched on it. What it is is that carbon is very volatile. This is one of the challenges with measuring how much carbon is put down. Because carbon wants to find oxygen and become CO2. That's its goal. So if, if you are plowing the ground and, and making that available, then it wants to link up again with, with oxygen in the air. So the only way to have the carbon stably in the ground is through the process that Lynn described, where the photosynthesis brings it down, goes into the roots, the hi-fi, make the aggregates, and the carbon then is in a of a fairly stable form below ground. So I don't know if that answers the question or- Yeah, I, I think it, it, you know, uh, it's gotten to be a, quite a severe problem. UMass just released a report within recent months, or it could have been a year ago, I guess, that shows that uh, the the soil on uh, hilltops uh, in, in uh, a lot of the area of the Midwest is gone now. It's When you hear about erosion, we you often think of water, but a lot of the erosion is happening with, with oxidation of carbon because of bare ground. It's best to have living plants on the ground, but even if you just put a litter, mulch or something is better than bare ground. Yeah, if, if, if you look at nature, if there's ever a bare piece of ground, plants start to grow. It's just inevitable. <laughs> it gets covered. And that's what you're, that's what you, you know, we're trying to mimic nature in that respect, keep the ground covered. Maybe we have time for another question. Yeah, actually, we'll be able to stay on a couple of minutes longer, Lynn. Great. So there's a question about whether regenerative grazing reduces the potential of reaching tipping points. Um, you know, what kinds of, what what impact can it have? Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, well, it, it has to be widespread. That's the thing. Um, and as Rich says, it's, it's hard to measure, but... Um, 
uh, we know, uh, I think I mentioned that Reuters just came out with a report saying that um, most of the carbon that has been sequestered has not been through through gadgetry or high, high tech um, uh, solutions. It's it's so it's soil management. There's tremendous potential to sequester carbon in the soil, but uh, we need to get this uh, uh, regenerative grazing going. I mean, it's not it's not a matter just of individual dietary choices. People choosing to eat beef, for example, or or choosing not to. But uh, uh, vegetarians can support this because for the environmental reasons, there's so many benefits. And the chief among them, I think, is this carbon sequestration. Um, for one thing, eliminating all the um, uh, you know, climate problems associated with producing corn and, and feeding cattle and feedlots, but also on the positive side, sequ uh, sequestering carbon in the soil through this, through these natural systems, it's just you're you, you're utilizing, you're fostering photosynthesis, you're fostering nutrient cycling. These are these are um, natural systems that predated human folly, and we need we need to to um, to uh, go back to those, and and we can get there with the help of our uh, microbial allies, and 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 stop doing things that um, you know that that uh, harm the microbial soil life. Okay, and the last audience question, and then I, I would like to ask one of my own. You have pretty much answered this, but it has to do with methane release and the question of whether CAFOs actually help because the cows, the cattle that are in CAFOs can be slaughtered in a somewhat shorter amount of time yeah. than cattle on the ground. Well, that's a, that's a, as we said earlier. We were talking before the webinar about the straw men that the conventional system sets up. That cattle are on a feedlot for fewer months, fourteen months, versus being finished on grass in eighteen or twenty months. Therefore, they produce less methane. But but that, those studies do not look at the whole life cycle analysis of you know, the, the carbon going into the air, the fossil fuels, the compaction on the corn land, the downstream uh, flooding and, and the social costs of the flooding and the storms and the tornadoes and all those things that are associated, have to be counted into that shorter period of time on the feedlot. Well, the rich those studies don't look at that at all. Specifically, I think what the studies are not uh, in terms of the question that was asked regarding the methane, what what counteracts that is the fact that when these cattle are uh, taking these extra months to reach marketing marketable size, they are busy eating, and um, you know uh, I mentioned the feedback mechanism as they're grazing. The, the microbes are responding and they are sequestering the carbon. So what happens is in these studies that have been done comparing conventional uh, grazing, a conventional uh, feedlot management to regenerative is they don't count the carbon sequestration and that is the biggest thing. But it has been, that that life cycle analysis has been done and anybody interested should look up Richard Teague's work, that's T. E A G U E. I think we have that uh, for you. Um, he he he's done a, um, a a a paper. It was several years ago, but it's still uh, wonderfully helpful. Um, that explains that if you factor in the carbon sequestration, it is definitely a better climate deal. You know, considering the methane and considering the carbon, putting them all together. Um, uh, the regenerative grazing comes out ahead of the feedlot model. Was that was that clear, Paula? Do you think I answered that question? Yes, I do think so. Um, you. Several questions um, did have to do with water as distinct from carbon in terms of the importance of regenerative grazing, and um, yeah. So what, getting, so that, getting that water infiltration, but somebody has asked this question specifically in relation to what's going on in California. Um, oh, they've been in drought, yeah, well, they're in flood. Right, well, see, the, the, those are two sides of the same coin. 
<laughs> so in other words, if you, you know, many times uh, I, I've told people I could stop the, the flooding in the Mississippi. All you have to do is give me the three states of Illinois, Iowa, and Indiana. Just give them to me. We'll put them back in perennial grass. We'll put cattle back on that land. And those floods will stop. And it will actually change the weather. Because there's a different microclimate in the grass, there's different temperature on the ground, all those things that influence weather. But the water is the big one because we all have to drink water. And right now we've destroyed those systems um, <clears throat> that um, feed our aquifers, hold on to our water. You know, that whole system we learned in high school biology of the water, transpiration, rain, and that system has been radically broken and principally by agricultural practices but, in but other, you know. I think the question though, there was some confusion about water and carbon. And I think the confusion maybe comes from the fact that this well aggregated soil, this uh, um, uh, regenerative grazing, um, producing this, this uh, sponge like soil, it's storing both carbon and water um, it's the the structures themselves. The sponge itself is is largely carbon. Uh, these uh, filaments uh, that I mentioned that, that transport uh, the water and nutrients to the plants and transport carbon to the soil are largely made of carbon. Um, so the 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 structures themselves are carbon, and the, the the carbon is stored in the soil. But it's the spaces between the structures that between the aggregates that allows for the water to collect. So if if California had uh, if the soil was uh, was better able to um, infiltrate water, then when it did rain, it would soak in instead of running off. And, but you do that by creating what is called a carbon sponge. Does it, did that clarify it at all? Absolutely. Good. Yes. Um, there are several questions that have to do with numbers around the methane and whether there are distinct differences between the methane in feedlots and on the ground. But I, I want to... Um, let the audience know that there are some very important chapters in this book that have to do with reviving rural economies and what's needed in order to do that. And I think if we're going to be serious in contemplating uh, not only shorter, shorter supply chains between food and the consumers, the production and the consumers, we, we need to be real about the fact that um, um, local is actually going to become incredibly important and self-sufficiency is going to become incredibly important and rural economies are also key to this. So I just want to let people know that um, this book has very helpful information on what's needed in order to make rural economies viable what's needed in order for small and middle-sized farmers to be able to actually um, successful and prosperous as cattle growers or any other kind of, of growers. So um, one thing we point out, Paula, is that um, grass-fed beef offers lots of opportunities for populations that have been really marginalized that haven't been able to participate in our food system as owners, uh, operators, or skilled labor, because you, you don't need a lot to capitalize a grass-fed beef business. You can find ways to participate. You don't need a barn. You don't even need a tractor. And uh, we have a, a chapter on that, on turning a profit that just focuses on um, how how to how to become profitable on a shoestring, and um, it, it's it's exciting because uh, you know more people can participate. But I think the most important thing for people to do is one go to their grocery store and demand as rich as grass fed beef uh, produced domestically, but also 
talk to your elected representatives uh, because they're beginning to kind of get, they're beginning to hear about this. And some of them are interested in, in, in the message of the regenerative movement. And they need to know that the farm bill this uh, for 2023 needs to reflect regenerative agriculture and specifically regenerative grazing. So, so read the book and get your talking points and head for the state house, head for the Capitol and um, give them a little information. Okay. Um, yeah, the last question was very much on my mind too. As regenerative grazing expands, what thoughts do you have for expansion of processing facilities to accommodate the increased number well, the question is the increased number of cattle, but I don't think it's the increased number, it's the distribution. Right. 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 No, that's a, that's a conundrum, and it, we don't have time to get into it all, but um, it's kind of the chicken and the egg. You know, one of the reasons there's not a lot of processing facility is because there's not a lot of cattle. There's a lot of money coming out from the government now trying to increase processing capabilities, but still, you'll go to these small plants, and some of them will be kind of almost empty in February, March, and April. Whereas in the fall, in November, they're going to be, you know, packed to the gills. So it's a, it's a system that does need to grow in conjunction with the, the additional uh, <clears throat> number of cattle. Well, but, you, you mean, Ridge, is what you're saying is the cattle that are produced by small scale producers is the, the big four are producing, you know, that they have no shortage of cattle, but they're conventionally raised cattle. So um, as I think what, what Ridge is saying is that as we have more people producing cattle, uh, you know, on, on a smaller scale basis all over the country, new facilities yes, will them. arise. They and actually the Biden administration has pledged funding for that, for developing uh, processing facilities. We'll see. We have a chapter in processing in the book. Oh, it's a very important chapter. Policies. Actually, I found that a very important chapter. We have to close, but I just want to um, give you a comment from Diana Donlan, who is the director of Soil Centric, um, who says, I remember Ridge saying that when food comes on a train from California, New Hampshire is at the end of the line. That's then he said, what does New Hampshire have in abundance? Rocks, grass, and water. It doesn't have the climate to grow fruits and vegetables. We can't eat grass. Please tell Ridge it was an eye opener. So. <laughs> good. <laughs> okay. Well, <That's> good. <clears throat> thank you both very much. Bye now. Bye now. Bye.